Psalm 67. The Bible reads, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Salah, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth, Salah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this church, Lord. We thank you that we can be gathered today and hear your word. God, just help me with my focus, Lord. I'm a bit nauseated, and I'm just struggling all day today, Lord, with dizziness. And Lord, I just pray you help me to just keep my focus. Lord, help us to hear from you, Lord. And um, I just pray that you'd just um, open our hearts, Lord, to understand how best to praise you, Lord, with song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so taken from Psalm 67 there, I just want to take basically the title of the message is Let All the People Praise Thee. That's the title of the message tonight. Let all the people praise thee. And we are commanded to praise the Lord, right? Our Lord is uh, worthy of all praise. Our Lord is worthy of honor and, and, and uh, worship, isn't he? Now, we serve a great God. He's given us so much. He's given us salvation. He's given us eternal life. He's promised us rewards in heaven should we obey him and do the works. He's promised us mansions on high. You know, he's promised us new bodies, you know, everlasting, immortal, uh, perfect bodies. He's given us so many things, right? He's given us the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. Right? All the curse of the law, the punishment, the wrath of God, He's been taken from us, put upon Christ on the cross. You know, He's given us so much. You know, the Bible says we love Him because He first loved us, right? And so because of that, He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of, of, our, of our love and appreciation, right? Let all the earth praise Him. Now, I, I believe this chapter, and I'm just using this chapter, I'm not going to be preaching the whole chapter, I'm just taking a few thoughts from here and using that as my springboard to get onto other things, but I believe this chapter in particular is actually referencing the millennial kingdom of Christ to come. Because it's talking about the whole earth praising Him. Let, let all the people praise Thee. You know, are all the people praising God right now? You know, has there ever been a time where all the people of the earth are praising God? There hasn't been, right? It hasn't come. And so it is, it is real, it is true that within all the nations, there are saved people. It is true that within all the nations, those saved people are praising the Lord. So there's a truth to that. But if, if the whole earth is going to praise Him, and we see this, this uh, prophecy, I suppose, taking place, I believe that's in the millennial kingdom, and obviously you can apply that to the new heavens and the new earth, where everybody is openly praising God because Christ is reigning on His throne. So, as I said, let all the people praise Him. It's our, look, as people of God, as the saved, as his children, we ought to praise him, right? We ought to serve him and worship him. The first thing I want you to keep in mind, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Ephesians 5, verse 19. The first thing I want you to keep in mind, I'm going to be preaching on singing, right? Uh, Ephesians 5, 19, while you're turning there. Obviously, on Sunday, I started in the book of Psalms. And what is Psalms? Do you guys know what it is? It's a sacred song. It's a sacred song. It's a song that's been sanctified for the Lord's worship. That's what a psalm is. It doesn't just mean any song. There are many, many songs, right? We know of many songs throughout the world, so you can sing about many different topics. But when you sanctify or, or separate a song specifically for the Lord, that is called a psalm. And the, the biggest book in the Bible, as far as the number of chapters, anyway, 150 chapters, is the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is the songbook of the Bible, right? It's the songbook of the Bible, Okay, so God put this songbook right, pretty much right in the middle of our Bibles because He wants us to take those psalms and sing praises to Him. All right, it's a command to sing praises to Him. Look at Ephesians five verse nineteen. Ephesians five verse nineteen. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is a command. We ought to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay? This isn't an optional thing. Okay? Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that singing, first, yes, is a command, but singing is not just for your benefit. Of course, you singing the words of God, you singing of His doctrines is going to uplift you, is going to edify you, but it's not just for your sake, it's for the sake of others. Look at that. Speaking to yourselves. 
right? Yourselves. So it's talking to multiple people. This is to the Ephesian church. This letter was written to multiple people, not just to one person. So when we sing, we sing to ourselves, right? We sing to one another when we lift up our voices and sing. Okay, that's something I want you to notice. It's not just for your prophet, it's for the prophet of others that we sing songs. But also, look at the end of that verse, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we're also singing to the Lord. We sing to uplift ourselves, we lift to edify one another in the church, but we also sing in our heart to the Lord. And so when we take time and we sing the, you know, the hymns, I always want you to guys remember, please always remember, we're singing praises to God, right? We're not just doing some, some formal part of the service just to get to the preaching. You know, just, we're just going through the motions to get to the preaching. No, you know? And the other thing that I, I've observed, with, like a lot of churches, a lot of people come late. And thankfully, thankfully, we don't have a problem in this church. Everyone seems to come on time, you know? But thankfully, you know, we don't have that problem in this church. But in many churches that, that I've been to, People come really late. They come just like pretty much full in time for the sermon. You know, it's kind of like the, the singing at the beginning of the service. That's kind of like the optional thing. That just gives enough time for people to turn up to hear the sermon. No, you know, you get to church on time to sing praises to, Lord, to the Lord, right? He's deserving of our love. He's deserving our support. And with you being present, you're supporting and edifying one another in song. Okay, the next thing that I want you to notice there, it says singing and making melody in your heart. You know, in your heart, making melody in your heart. Now, when we sing, you got to make sure that, again, it's not just vain repetition that you're doing, right? We know that vain repetition of prayers, you know, we know that the Lord does not enjoy that. We know that He doesn't receive any worship from that, right? And sometimes we can look at, say, the Roman Catholic Church, and we can look at how they repeat the prayers, you know, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, um, our Father, is that the other one, Christina? Our Father. Or they repeat some prayer book. They've got some prayer book and they just repeat those words on that prayer book. And that's, that's vain repetition, you know? But you know, as Baptists, as Christians, we also can do vain repetition. Like we can open our, up our hymn books. Yep, we're singing song number whatever. Just, just say the words and not really focus on what we're singing. That is vain repetition. If all we're doing is lifting up the words from our mouth, but it's not in our heart. We're not thinking about what is being said. We're not singing from our heart. We're not singing through the emotions that the Lord has put in our heart. Then you can also be in danger of vain repetition. Making melody in your heart. You know, it's possible to sing without your heart. Okay? But it's impossible to sing in your heart that doesn't, and doesn't come out of your mouth. I'll just read a psalm to you. Psalm 19.14. Psalm 19.14 says this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So when we sing songs, we want to make sure that the songs that we sing are acceptable to the Lord, right? That means we have to sing with the words of our mouth, but also that meditation of our heart. Those two things go together in the Bible. What our mouth says ought to reflect what is in our heart. Okay, Luke 6.44, um, I'll just read it to you. Luke 6.44 says, For every tree is known... By his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor, uh, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. You guys are familiar with that, right? For the, of, of, the, of the abundance of his heart, of the heart his mouth speaketh. Okay? So, Make sure when you sing, it is coming from your heart, right? It's like when we, when we preach the gospel, right? We go and preach the gospel door to door to people. We knock on their doors. They hear the gospel. They say they want to call upon the name of the Lord. You know, we say, okay, you know, these are some words you can repeat after me or whatever. You can say this prayer. But we always tell them, right? It's not just magic words, right? It's not just these words. Don't, you know, you're not trusting those words for salvation. You're trusting the fact that you've put your faith on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And now this is just reflecting and just telling God, you know, you've accepted Christ. You believe on Him. You've accepted the free, of, of, uh, free gift of salvation. And you want to make sure that you're eternally going home to heaven. You know, it's the same thing, right? We ask them to say those words, but we want to make sure it's reflecting what they've truly believed in their heart. It's the same thing with, with anything that we do, right? Anything that comes out of our mouth, we can lie. We can pretend to be Christians that we're not. We can pretend to be walking the paths of God. But is it in your heart? Are you, is that reflecting in your heart? Only you know that. And you can't, you know, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. 
right? And if we're praising God, we're worshiping God, we want to make sure that our hearts are right before Him. Okay, those two things go together. Singing from your heart ought to come out of your mouth. Uh, and let, let me just show you this. Maybe you want to turn there. Matthew 15, Matthew 15, verse 7. Matthew 15, verse 7. Because I just want to show to you from the scriptures that it is possible to sing or honor the Lord with your mouth, yet it all be in vain, right? It can still all be in vain. It can still be empty, right? Because we spend time, we spend like 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes singing songs, singing praises. We want those praises, we want that worship to count, right? We want the Lord to be pleased. We want it to be acceptable to the Lord, right? We don't want to just do it vainly, waste our time, and the Lord's not, 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 not uh, pleased by it, and we're wasting our, our voices, wasting our time. Look at Matthew 15, verse 7. Jesus speaking, and I know this is not about singing, singing, but the principle is true. Matthew 15, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So can we worship God in vain? Yes. We can think we're worshipping the Lord. We can as a church be worshipping, praising the Lord, and it ought, all can be in vain if it's just with our lips. If we're just worshipping with, with our mouth, with our lips, but it's not coming from the heart, right? It's not coming from the heart. We need to make sure that we sing our praises to the Lord from the heart. We want to make sure that our worship, we are doing that every week, we're doing that every Sunday, we're doing that every Thursday. Let's make it count, right? Let's make it count. Focus upon the words that you're singing and make sure you mean those words, singing them to the Lord, singing them to one another so we may be edified as a church. The next thing that I want you to pick up on uh, with singing, turn to Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. It's a very similar passage to Ephesians 5.19. But Colossians 3.16 is that singing is a teaching ministry. Did you know that? Singing is a teaching ministry. When we sing, we're teaching. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you rich, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There it is again, in your hearts, right? Singing. But the thing that I want you to notice there is teaching and admonishing one another, right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. The songs that we sing ought to be the words of the Lord. They ought to be doctrinally sound. They ought to come from the, from the Bible. Teaching and admonishing one another. So I, I want you to realize that when we sing songs, we're teaching one another. We're learning doctrine. There ought, there ought to be time when you're, when you're singing those songs and you're going, wow, that is true. Amen. I, I, you know, amen with that. And I, I've, you know, there are some churches that I've been to, they're singing the psalms and then I, I also hear, amen, just during the, during, during the singing, right? During the singing of the hymns. Because there's some truth. Yeah, amen. That's true. You know, we're singing that to one another. There's been many nice doctrines, many good doctrines I've learned just singing from the, from the, from the hymns. And then I've gone later and I've read my Bible and I go, hold on, that's from that hymn. I didn't realize at the time that that was actually a phrase from the Bible or what have you, right? And that's why, you know, that's why we do have hymn books, right? That's why we do have the old-fashioned hymns, you know, the, what's this one, the soul-stirring songs and hymns. This is why I don't like the contemporary, modern contemporary Christian music, is because these songs are very reflective to what we see in the Psalms. That is a very much full of doctrine, right? Um, if, when you look at the book of Psalms, when you read the book of Psalms, there's a lot of doctrine. And I don't know if you know this, but it's the book that's most often quoted in the New Testament, right? I mean, the Old Testament's full of prophets, the major and minor prophets. It's got the writings of, of Moses. And yet the Lord chooses to go back to the Psalms more often than any other book to uh, speak about the Lord Jesus Christ and the New Testament churches, okay? So there's a lot of heavy doctrine in those Psalms. And when I look at the Christian music available today, the music that lines up more with the Psalms are the hymns. You know, the old-fashioned hymns. Full of doctrine, full of phrases straight from the Bible. And that is what our, you know, that's why God gave us the Psalms. So we can look at that and then say, look, all our music ought to comply with what we see in the Psalms. Full of doctrine, full of truth, right? 
And the other reason I like the hymns is because it, it assists with congregational singing. The very, once you kind of know the tune, it's very easy to follow. It's not anything fantastic or, or you know, confusing. And it's easy to follow. You can quickly learn the songs. And then, you know, once you learn the tune, you can sing many, many stanzas of the same hymn. Whereas I know, because I, I went to a Christian school where they sang a lot of Christian contemporary music with the, you know, with the projector and all the words and, and the band playing. I was sometimes, I didn't know where they were going, right? Sometimes they'd repeat that, sometimes they'd repeat that, they'd repeat the chorus, they'd start all over again, sometimes they'd just repeat the same. That's the other thing. Quite often they'll just repeat the same few words, the same phrases over and over and over and over again, kind of like trying to get people in this hypnosis trance, you know, thinking, oh, the Holy Spirit's come upon us, you know, over and over and over again. Empty, rep, you know, empty repetition, right? It's vain, we don't see that in the Psalms. Yes, there's repetition because the, the songs we do repeat, you know, we, we sing choruses in our hymn books. We are repeating the same words. But hey, we're not doing it over and over and over and over trying to get people hypnotized and, you know, that, that really, that's really what's going on. You know, people are being moved by, by, by the music rather than moved by the Holy Ghost. And, you know, as far as, you know, I'm not against new songs. I'm certainly not against new songs. I mean, I, I don't know when this was last edited. I think in the 80s. So I'm not against new hymns, I'm not against new songs that are right on, on doctrine and, and that are, can, can be sung by con congregation. You know, maybe one day we'll introduce some new songs. But I'm certainly not going to sing the stuff from Hillsong and, and of, you know, of that nature. No way, you know? No way. The other problem with, with, with singing songs, and look, I know there are some independent fundamental Baptists, churches now, adopting the music from Hillsongs and singing that, right? And I know, okay, you know, yes, there, are some, there is some truth in those songs, but here's the problem. Their children are going to grow up singing that song, that, that music. They're going to realize, hey, this is so much more appealing to the flesh than the old-time hymns. They're going to fall in love with the hill songs and that. And they're going to start going after their doctrine, which is false gospel, right? It's works-based gospel. It's you can lose your salvation gospel. And the kids are going to get caught up in that in these churches that uh, sing. So it's, you know, it's my responsibility as a bishop, as the overseer, to make sure that the songs we sing you know, will keep us aligned doctrinally and also, you know, be, uh, allow us to sing praises to the Lord. One of the questions that comes up is, well, if singing songs is a teaching ministry, then, you know, should women sing it, right? Should, should women sing songs? And obviously, you guys know that. That comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. I'll just read it to you quickly. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, so that's the, that's the role of, of a woman in the church is that they're not, they're not allowed to teach. They're not allowed to get behind the pulpit and teach. Man, I know that is so old-fashioned and I know that's so outdated and I know many women out there just hate that. But that's the Word of God. And if the Word of God is our authority, we need to stand by that, right? Okay? Now, so the question comes up, well, if women are not allowed to teach behind the pulpit, then should they even be singing if it's a teaching ministry? Um, turn with me to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. And one of the... Because I, I have heard this used. I have heard it used where it says, well, hold on. You know, women were leading in the singing, and that's a teaching ministry, so what's, why is that any different to, to teaching you know, behind the pulpit and preaching? Well, turn to uh, Exodus 15. Exodus 15, verse 20. Now, this is shortly after Israel was delivered from Egypt. Okay, shortly after they were delivered from Egypt... Exodus 15, verse 20. It says here, And Miriam, you guys know who Miriam is, right? The sister of Moses. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancers. And Miriam answered them, saying, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed uh, gloriously. The horse and his rider have you thrown into the sea. And I've heard this argument used. Well, see, Miriam here, she's leading the singing. No. Look at verse number 1. Exodus 15, verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song. Who's leading the song? Moses. Moses is leading the song and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, look what he says, look at what the song is, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. What did Miriam sing? In verse 21, Miriam answered. What does answer mean? She responded to that song. It's like when we just sang, It is well, right? The first people sang, It is well, 
and then there was an answer. It is well with my soul, with my soul. That's an answer. You're repeating back what was said before. And that's what Miriam exactly did in verse 21. Miriam answered them saying, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So, can we, so what do we get out of this from this Old Testament? Was Miriam leading the singing? Was she in charge of the teaching as far as song? No, it was Moses, right? And Miriam and the other women, they're answering back. They're singing back the same words of that song, right? I just want you to notice that because I have heard people use this and then extrapolate that, say, well, see, women can teach behind the pulpit. No, you know, men ought to take the leadership role in song because it is a teaching ministry. And I, I know there are many pastors that hold to different views on this, uh, many different positions. I'm not against a woman singing. I'm not against a woman coming here and giving a special, as long as it's being led by a man. All right? So if I ever got my family to come up and give you a special song, I'd make sure that I was the one leading it and coordinating it. Okay? So that's, just, that's what we see in the Old Testament. We see women are allowed to sing song in praises to the Lord. Uh, but my preference is that we would just sing congregational songs so we can all participate, we can all um, enjoy that. Uh, now, let me just, uh, I'll just read to you, I'll read to you 1 Corinthians 14, 26. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Because I know there are some people that are against someone coming and actually giving a special. Like, if someone came up to me and said, Kevin, you know, there's this song that I love, I've learnt this new song, great doctrine, I think it'll be a blessing to the church, you know, and you tell me about it, I, I'm, I'm more than likely going to say, all right, you know, next week, you know, bring, come forward, sing it for, I don't know if there's anyone that's musically talented like that, that would be willing to do that, but I wouldn't be against it. And I'll show you why. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, it says this, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, so talking about church coming together, every one of you have a psalm, have a doctrine, have a tongue, have a revelation, have an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Okay? So there are people that were coming to church, but they weren't organized. The first Corinthian church weren't organized. That's why, that's why Paul had to write to them. So some of you have a psalm, some of you have a song, right? Some of you have, have a, a doctrine, some of you have a tongue or a revelation or interpretation. It says, just make sure it's all done unto edifying and it's all done orderly. You can read the chapter, you'll understand that Paul is saying, look, make sure it's orderly, otherwise people think you're crazy. So, but it's fine for someone to come and bring a psalm. It's fine for someone to come and bring a song. If that's something they believe the Lord has led them to do, uh, just make sure you raise that with me first and I'll be more than happy to allow you to sing a song. But I, I'm probably thinking that nobody right now is willing to do that. So. But anyway, I just want you to know where I stand on that. I have no problem with special items. I have no problem with a lady singing a special item as long as it's being led by a man. Okay? Now, so because songs are a teaching ministry, because we're teaching one another, that means songs should be filled with doctrine. I already covered that, right? Songs must have true doctrine. Uh, you know, Colossians 3.16, I know we turn away, but it says there, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, right? The word of God is ought to be something that we spend our time meditating on and teaching one another. Because then it says that teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So that is one way to make sure that the, the word of God is dwelling richly in you is the singing of the words of God, singing of true doctrine and edifying one another. We should be singing the words of Christ. It doesn't just, just, it doesn't just say teaching, it says admonishing one another in Psalms. What does it mean to admonish one another? What does it mean? It means basically to reprimand, right? <laughs> it's a reprimand uh, to urge for corrective action, right? You're doing something wrong and somehow singing can fix that. <laughs> singing can set you back into place. If you're, if you're not walking with the Lord, you're in sin, songs ought to be able to reprimand you. And, you know, you might be wondering, well, how does that work? I'll give you one example, and I've had someone approach me for this. Uh, uh, we already sang Footprints of Jesus, but I'll just turn there quickly. 310, Footprints of Jesus. Now it says here, I'll just read the first bit. It says, Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me, and we see where thy footprints fall in, lead us to thee. Then he goes, Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow, we will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Right? And I had someone come up to me and go, Kevin, I, like, I don't want to sing those songs. 
I, I don't want to sing, you know, I'm, I'm following you, Lord, because I'm not. I've got areas in my life where I'm in sin. I've got areas of my life that, yes, there are times I follow the Lord and there are other times that I'm, 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 I'm just serving myself and doing wrong things. I feel ashamed to sing those words. But that's because you're being reprimanded by the, by the, by the words, right? It's, it's not saying necessarily that, hey, yeah, I line up perfectly. Everything that I do in my life, I'm walking with Jesus Christ so I can sing this boldly and, and, and uh, you know, praise the Lord. You know, but you know, you know, people that feel that way are afraid that if they sing these words that God's going to somehow chastise them. No, you're not. You're not walking with me. But no, hold on. It's fine to sing the words. I, I know we fall short. You know, I think of words like, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender I surrender all. Have you really surrendered all? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt you surrendered your whole life. But does that mean we shouldn't sing it? No. It ought, you ought to be reprimanded. You ought to go, yeah, oh man, I, I surrender all, but Lord, I fall short. That's been reprimanded in song. You know, s- s- music and, and singing can do that. And it ought to, don't be ashamed of singing those songs. You know, go, yeah, Lord, I, I need to surrender all. Help me to live up to what I'm singing. You know, so, yeah, you know, it, it's not just teaching, it's also admonishing one another. In those songs uh, but uh, and again I already mentioned that that's why that's my big problem with Christian contemporary music is that it's not filled with doctrine it is so vague it is so shallow it doesn't even take words from the Bible it uses all this fancy modern Christian you know love on you phraseology <laughs> I don't know, th- things that you know this and it's not even words that aren't even in the Bible I don't even know what I'm singing you know I remember when I, when I was singing these songs I felt like I was singing some love song you know, some love song from a, from a girlfriend to her boyfriend. That's, that's, you know, this is a romantic song. I, I didn't feel like I'm singing praises to the Lord because the words I was singing weren't lining up with the words of the Bible, weren't lining up with the doctrines of the Bible. They're so shallow, they can be sung. You, can, you, can, you, you could take some of those songs, put them in the top, you know, 100, billboard, you know, whatever it is, and it'll be just fine. It'll do well. It'll, it'll be number one. Right, because a lot of these songs borrow elements as well from, from worldly music, worldly uh, songs. So that's why they're so popular. That's why they appeal to the flesh so much. Is they are they're borrowing elements from the world to sing these songs, and it's so shallow. It doesn't even touch a spirit. All it does is uh, 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 sow to the to the flesh. So you know, be careful with the with the songs that you sing. Be careful with the hymns that you sing. Um, let me give you one example. If you guys you got you, you got your hymn books, turn to hymn number two hundred and forty. 240. And look, I, I love this hymn book. I think it's got a lot of good hymns. I think it's got a lot of good ones in here. But again, uh, uh, some of you weren't here when, I, when we handed out the hymn books, but I did warn you guys, be careful because there's a lot of false doctrine in these hymn books as well. So don't just think every song here is fantastic and wonderful. No, test it out first. Read it before you sing it. Is, does this line up doctrinally with the Bible? Are there any false doctrines? But 240, Lily of the Valley, the Lily of the Valley... And uh, sorry, Lily, for, for using this example. Uh, but this, this, this hymn is, is, is false. This hymn is false doctrine. Okay? Uh, it's a very popular hymn. It's sung by a lot of churches. And every time when churches would sing this, I would refrain. I wouldn't sing this. And I'd ask my family, I don't want you to sing this because it's false. I want you to sing what is true, what is right. And you say, well, why, why is that? Look at the first bit there. I have, a, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, the lily of the valley, in him alone I see. Who's the lily of the valley in this hymn book? It's Jesus, right? They're referring to Jesus as the lily of the valley. Now, is Jesus the lily of the valley? Is, you know, this is not a hymn that we can just fix. The, the, the title is lily of the valley. Is Jesus the lily of the valley? No. Take your Bibles, take your Bible, turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And the Song of Solomon is another song. You know, it's, 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 not, in the, in, it's not in the Psalms, but it's another song. It's the Song of Songs. I think it's, it's Solomon's greatest song. It's been put in the Bible. He was moved by the Holy Ghost to write this book. Song of Solomon, chapter, uh, chapter 2. Now, what you need to understand about the Song of Solomon is that it is a love song. That is, it is definitely a love song, the whole book. It's a love song be- between a husband and a wife, okay? And many times in that book, the husband is, is speaking, and many times the wife is speaking. And you see there's interchangeable times where they take turns. They speak about their beloved, you know, saying about her or she and, and the daughters, and then sometimes about him and, and the sons, and, and, you know, you can see this interchange 
changeable ta thing taking place. But look at Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible reads, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. That's where the song gets its title from. Okay, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now let's just stop there for a minute. We know this, this, this book is about a husband and wife. If you just said, if someone was saying, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, do you think that would be the, the wife or the husband speaking? Like, without anything else, you think it's, it's the wife, right? It's very feminine, roses, lilies, right? But then look at verse number two. Now, the husband is responding to the wife. The wife said these words, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. The husband responds in verse number two, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So it's comparing, use a lot of poetic language, a lily with many thorns, okay? He's saying that my love, like my wife, is like that lily among thorns. My love, um, so is my love among the daughters. So amongst all the women, you know, in Israel, you know, he's saying my wife is, is like that lily amongst thorns, right? All the other women, they're like thorns. They're dangerous, they can hurt me, but no, not my lily. <laughs> my lily, she's, you know, sh uh, she's pleasant, she's something that I can uh, appreciate. And uh, the other women, they're like thorns. And you know, you ought to take note of that, men. You know, your wife ought to be your lily, right? <laughs> your wife ought to be your lily. The other women out there, they're thorns. They're going to hurt you. They're going to corrupt you, right? Make sure you have your eyes upon your wife alone, okay? Now, that's what the husband is saying to the wife. Um, and then uh, look at verse number three. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 3. Now the wife responds back to the husband in verse number 3. She says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So remember, the lily was amongst the, the daughters. Now she's saying, my, my husband, my beloved, is, like, is um, uh, among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So she's saying, look, it's like, a, it's like trees of the wood, like a forest. Lots of trees, right? All these men, all, all, the, all these, these um, you know, men of Israel, it's all these trees of wood. But my beloved, my husband, is like a tree there, yeah, but it's like an apple tree. An apple tree that gives me shadow and great, you know, his shadow. With, I sat down under his shadow, so he gives me shade. You know, he gives me uh, shade from the, from the sun. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. So this tree is fruitful. This tree, her husband, provides for her feeds her, looks after her. That's how she sees her husband, as this apple tree amongst, you know, this forest of trees. And he sees his wife as this lily among thorns. Okay, that's the, that's the interaction that's happening between husband and wife. And if you're still not sure if the lily is referring to the wife, look at verse 16. Verse 16, in the same chapter. It says, and this is the wife speaking, it should be obvious, it says, my beloved is mine and I am his. So who's speaking? It's the wife, right? I am his. He feedeth amongst the lilies. He feedeth among the lilies. So this is, again, poetic language um, of their love toward one another. And she's describing his love to her as him feeding amongst the lilies. Referring to herself, right? And so when we take a song like that, the lily of the valley, and we say, oh, that's Jesus. No, that's a reference to the wife. That's a reference to a woman. That's feminine. I'm not going to sing feminine qualities about Jesus Christ. That's a false doctrine. If it was called the apple tree of the valley, then we could sing that, right? But it's not. You know, it's, it's about the lily of the valley. That's false doctrine. So you've got to make sure you be careful when you sing hymns that they line up doctrinally with the Word of God. Okay. The next thing that I want to cover is, and I'm just going to read some references to you, is to sing loudly. When you sing, sing not just with all your heart, but sing with all your mouth. Sing with your lips. Sing loudly. Proclaim loudly the words of God. Psalm 98 verse 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. I love it when it gets loud when we sing. I don't like it when it's loud when I'm preaching because I get confused. But when we're singing, I love it when it gets loud, right? And I love singing in this auditorium because you've got the echo and it sounds like there's many more people singing. Sing loud. Psalm 51, 14. Deliver me from uh, blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. My tongue shall sing aloud. Psalm 59, 16. 
but I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defence and refuge in the day of my trouble. Psalm 81 verse 1. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Psalm 149 verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. So, is there any doubt in your mind that God wants us to sing loud? He wants us to sing with everything that we've got. I love it. I love it when it's loud. And sometimes I say, guys, sing it up. And there it gets loud. It's awesome, right? I take pleasure in it. But I know I'm taking pleasure in it because I know the Lord takes pleasure in it. He wants us to sing loud. And you know, you might be saying, but Kevin, you know, I haven't got the best voice. You know, I, I can't follow the tune. You know, I, I'm, I'm, but here's the thing. One thing that I've learned and discovered is that the more you sing, the better you're going to get. It's, like, it's just like anything. The more you practice it, the better you're going to get at it. Okay, I, I'm not really... If you heard me sing in the past, you noticed that I was not the best, right? I, I'm still not the best. But now I can do a lot better. I can follow a lot more. And song leading has helped me in that as well. Um, but honestly, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Like, I'm not saying you need to have... I know some people are talented with beautiful voices. You know, the Lord's given them those, those gifts and talents. But God's given you your voice. Whatever you sound like, He wants you to use that voice to praise Him. So do it loud. And look, sometimes some songs get a bit high and sometimes they get a bit low. And here's the thing, and I looked this up, this is true. If you sing quietly, your range of notes is going to be limited. But the, the louder you sing, the more you open up you know, your voice, the more likely you're going to hit the range of the higher notes or the range of the lower notes. Okay? That's just a proven fact. The, more, the louder you sing, the more capable your voice will be to reach those, those notes that you might struggle to sing otherwise. So please, you know, if, and I understand that many of these hymns you guys have not sung before, you're getting used to them, I get that. But once you know them, get them in your heart, know what the words say, and then make sure your, your mouths reflect what's in your heart, those praises to the Lord. Sing loud, sing loud. Um, yeah, and just remember, it, it is God that gave you your voice, all right? So let the people praise Him. Let's pray.